I think good and evil is within ourselves. But I respect the beliefs of people who take the Bible literally. I'm certainly not sure that they're not right. And uh, so I think there's something in it for people who take the Bible straight. And I think there's something in it for people who merely want a, a form of escapism in a traditional and very exciting and very frightening uh, uh, suspense mystery tale. Does it bother you, Greg, that many people are going to try to make comparisons between the omen and the exorcist? Oh, no. No, that doesn't bother me at all. It's, uh, it seems to be a new genre uh, of this, of the demonic or the satanic film. I don't know how long it will last, uh, not indefinitely, I'm sure, but uh, there is an interest for one reason or another. Uh, I believe it's escapism because we, we live in troubled times and people are uncertain uh, of many things. Hey guys, welcome back to the Blood and Black Run podcast. I'm Ryan from ColdSplitation.com, and I'm joined with my co-host Martin. How's it going? Doing pretty well. We um, are back. It's April now. We missed April Fool's Day, but we've already done that movie, so who cares? We had an eclipse, so we were a little early with Asteroid City. I know. I thought that too. I thought that was kind of funny. We 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 actually accidentally kind of hit on a theme there. And then we also, uh, we with the eclipse, we missed doing like Twilight Eclipse. I was thinking, I was thinking more because I was sending you the Little Shop of Horrors reels. That would have been, you know, a good thing to do. Yeah, but you ignored me because you hate Rick Moranis for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen the Rick Moranis Little Shop of Horrors. You never have seen that? Wow, I don't think so. No. Um, yeah, and then, you know, it, it was kind of open to discussion as to what we wanted to do this week. Uh, recently, I watched Darkman, which is I was the first time I've seen Darkman, uh, Sam, the Sam Raimi film, superhero movie, basically, the uh, 1990s version of, uh, you know, the new superhero movies that are constantly coming out that we started covering and then decided why bother. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of cool. And I thought, like, well, maybe it would be kind of fun to do Darkman, but we'll do that some other time. Um, yeah, so we settled on a different kind of movie, one that also kind of ties in, uh, with things that are going on right now. You had mentioned to me like, Hey, the first omen is coming out to theaters, which I know t in listening world sounds kind of deceptive. The first mm -hmm. omen, not the, not the first movie of the omen, but no, quite literally the first omen is what it's called. And, uh. Is it so, a Blumhouse film? I know nothing about it. I just literally saw honestly, a trailer for Honestly, that's it a other. good question. I don't know if it is. You know, because now almost everything is a Blumhouse movie. Like, if you go – and it doesn't even need to proclaim it. It's just like, yeah, it's a fucking Blumhouse movie. <laughs> um, I don't think it is. It's 20th Century Studios. Fa Phantom Forest Production Company. Gotcha. The yeah, yeah, no. Century I yeah, it's not. But you know what? It could. It, it certainly could have been. Uh, it's not <laughs> out of the realm of possibility to have it be a Blumhouse movie. Then, like I said, everything can be a Blumhouse movie, and it's really not not a surprise anymore when you go and find out it's got like that opening Avengers like Marvel like here's all the fucking shit we've done in Blumhouse <laughs> world, you know, th strewn together into like that opening uh, intro. Do you think um, Danny, McBr Danny McBride has been locked in like a basement somewhere now? And that's why he's like tagged to everything now. Cause they're just like, make a new script, Danny. And he's like, I just want to do a new season of Eastbound. And <laughs> well, to be honest with you, if they do have him chained, he's uh, clearly not putting in the effort because you know, I think he did co-write co um, The Exorcist <laughs> Believer, too, right? 
Yeah. And uh, we pretty much lambasted that one. Um, I actually do have the Exorcist Believer on 4K. I got it for review and I have not uh, dived back into that one because just doing the screenshots I'm sorry alone. That you have, sorry that you just have it, just thrown it in the trash. I know. Doing the screenshots alone reminded me of like how much nothing happens. You know, you're like going through <laughs> fucking fucking minutes after minutes. And you're like, I'm, I want to find an interesting screenshot, but there are none to be found. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But no, no, we're not doing the first omen. I didn't want to uh, preface this by saying that we, that's what we were doing. We didn't venture out to the theater to go see it. Although I have heard surprisingly that it is pretty good. And that's honestly very surprising because I thought it was going to be a bundle of trash. Um, it it's certainly like whenever you hear something like, oh, yeah, we're doing a fucking prequel to another movie like, oh, great, a prequel. I'm so interested. You know, it's, it's not... also a remake, the requel. Yeah. I don't know. It didn't really leave me any uh, expectations or interest, so I didn't really plan on seeing it. But instead of the first omen, we decided that we're going to do the first omen. The omen. <laughs> the, actual, <laughs> the actual first omen. The omen. Yeah. Um, from 1976. Some may him. also know it as uh, Exorcist Light. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Came out after The Exorcist and was kind of inspired by The Exorcist in a lot of ways. But also, you know, does its own thing. Uh, directed by good old, as we were talking about, Dick Donner. So they like, uh, as, as apparently his, uh, you know, his... Uh, friends and friends family. and family know, know him as <laughs> so, our third richard donard film yeah i mean i didn't even realize you know when we talked about doing this one i didn't even put it together that we've already done two others we did scrooged and we did um lethal weapon. weapon yeah yeah i didn't realize it but uh yeah now that it, now that i think about it we sure did it's good. To, it's good that you are compiling that stuff because I might throw out here one day, like, "Hey, what do you think about? What do you think about <laughs> the <Lethal> weapon?" <laughs> well, after our one mishap with you and Django, you know, mixing your Django's up, uh, you have to be on the ball. You have to. Somebody has to kind of be, yeah, you, you know, and be stand the... stand by, flipping through anytime you pitch a film out, being like, "Did we do that?" The episode historian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you've seen The Omen before, you said, right? Yes. I've seen it, I think, twice now. I saw it, like, once in high school, and it was either on, like, TCM or a AMC and, like, during, like, uh, Halloween-y times. Sure. Um, one of the two. Didn't really take too much away from it, uh, because it was on, I think, late, especially if it was on TCM, but it was definitely on it late at night. Um, so I probably slept through half of it. And then the other time I saw it was like uh, probably around sophomore or junior year in college when I was kind of traipsing about a bunch of 70s films at the time. Because, you know, if you remember, that's when I was watching some like 70s Hammer and uh, like, you know, the Abominable Dr. Fives and shit like that. So, mm -hmm. uh Again, wa remember watching it, and it was engaged this time, but I don't remember being like, you know, really having much to say or mm -hmm. to think about. But I do, you know, understand that the film is part of the cultural zeitgeist, or at least was, because uh, now 50 years out, seems like it's uh, kind of been forgotten as like... Uh, important horror film uh, unless you're somebody who is really into you know horror films themselves yeah it's definitely not as dis as discussed as something like the exorcist um i think it does get overshadowed like after the exorcist too there were a lot a lot of movies that played up that same idea of the demon inside uh exorcism movies in particular uh but also you know, Omen, the Omen had its own spinoffs of itself because it did enough with the formula where it separated itself from the exorcist to the point, you know, like instead of a possessed kid here of a demon, you know, a normal kid that was possessed by a demon here, you have the literal spawn of Satan and 
you know, that's that's a little bit different. And I think it does dive into a, a few different themes that we'll talk about um, as we get more into the movie. But it, it, it kind of has its own spin on The Exorcist that it does fairly well. And, and I do agree that maybe now more so it has kind of lost its momentum. There was that time, you know, back in was it like 2005, I think it was or something like that, where the the remake came out and pretty much did kind of like that same same idea of uh, like Psycho with Vince Vaughn where it was basically a shot for shot, for sure. like re- doing the exact same thing, but just making it more contemporary. Um, that one, I think, has Liev Schreiber in it. Uh, speaking yeah. of, um, to to uh, draw another parallel to Asteroid City <laughs> last week, <laughs> or last time, we, uh, last episode. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, it definitely has its own uh, inspirations. Um, so from here, you know, you had more offshoots of besides the exorcist doing like possessed children, you had more offshoots of devil children, children that are the spawn of Satan, Antichrist type scenarios, um, literally, literally like combining uh, Rosemary's baby and uh, the exorcist into one. Yep. 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 Colorful family film. Yep. I mean, basically, yeah, this is a, a culmination of Rosemary's baby, but instead of, you know, having Rosemary's baby in it it stops literally at the time of the birth of the antichrist here. It's like, what if he was a six year old little shit or however, however (laughs) old he is in the omen. Um, Five, five. Yeah. It goes a little bit further than that from than Rosemary's baby. And then not only that, but after the omen, we also get sequels to the omen where it's like, what if the president had Damien, the antichrist and, what if he became the president and stuff like that, that it kind of gets a little bit more out there as it goes along. But um, have you seen any of the uh, sequels, additional no. Omen sequels? No, no. I did. I, guess I, the, I, I just know Sam Neill stars in the third yep, one. Yep. 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 So Sam Neill. Yeah. That's the only thing I know. I had. Yeah, I mean, uh, I watched them a while ago when Scream Factory came out with their Omen collection box set, which I got. So I watched all of them kind of like in order. Because I had never seen the sequels either. They're okay. Sam Neill's kind of fun in uh, number three. But overall, I don't think that one is like that great of a movie entirely. But um, I, to, to me, it's just. Like, it's not anything that I have. I'll ever have any interest in. Even if I lo- like and we'll talk about it, even if I love this film, I would have no interest in sequels for it. Because it's like not something that I think is trodden for sequel ground like the sustainability of like and then he grows up and then he does this as the antichrist and yeah yeah like it's like it's because well, it, it's stupid and even in this film you know the idea is like oh the end is coming like soon because yeah. now he's fucking been born so you know how long until the actual end comes and the, the whole movie is about uh gregory peck's character kind of investigating and finding out like oh shit like all of the revelation things are already mm-hmm. happening and like this is the last piece of it it's all falling into place the world's gonna end pretty soon so yeah the uh, the the extent of it where it's like oh now the antichrist is 60 years old and he still hasn't done anything <laughs> <laughs> so he hasn't done anything that sinister uh you know it's kind of wears out its welcome i think but I taught people how to say racist things while playing (laughs) Call of Duty. (laughs) Oh, super scary. (laughs) That would be it. Yeah, that would be a pretty good skit, to be honest with you. Just like the really mundane things like, uh, I made Panera Bread go downhill. They serve you lukewarm soup now. (laughs) As my dad would complain. It's never never hot. Never comes out hot. (laughs) <laughs> my dad my dad likes everything piping so you know it's funny too i just saw on facebook i've been getting like these little ads popping up it's like a new era for panera coming soon <laughs> so they're, they're, they're changing they're rebranding or, or maybe he's like i'm the one who got papa john fired from papa john's <laughs> and that's why their pizza still tastes right. like cardboard <laughs> you know it's it's gonna you know it's gonna it's gonna be panera bread and croissant <laughs> we're going to french panera has gone down here though no that's true god Soups. damn you damien 
right. <laughs> Let's take a break quick. Talk about the beer that we got on the show today. Because I know for sure we have not had this beer brewery on the show. You because I would remember the name. I would absolutely remember the name. You we think have. that, but you're old. That is also true. That's you true. forget that you're old and your mind is rotting. We have, and I've heard a lot about them, so I wanted to try them. We have Hoof Hearted Brewing. Yes, you heard that correctly. Hoof Hearted. Poof Hearted. Hoof Hearted. You know, like the deer hoof. Be kind of Go. weird. It's kind of funny though. the The name doesn't work that well if you have like a some sort of accent, like, or if you say it very enunciated, like hoof hearted. Doesn't work as well. But anyway, you know the age old, uh, age old joke there. We have hoof hearted brewing. Uh, then they have a pale ale called the Dukes of Ripstick Super Party Pale Ale, and uh, I want to check this out because, like I said, I've heard quite a bit about hoof hearted. I've heard that they're pretty good. It sounds like you say who farted every yeah. single time. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> it's good for the podcast, right? It's a, it's a good uh, it's a good listening experience. It's good a- ASMR for the... Listen, brows held high. Words. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> um, So I've never had them. I've heard a lot about them. I have heard them in the same vein as something, you know, like some of the higher end type ipa breweries uh so i wanted to try them out and at our local beer universe they did have a couple of them and i went with the pale ale because for one thing i'll just be honest it's, it was much cheaper it was like you know 14.99 <laughs> versus <laughs> almost 30 dollars for their you know their Jeez. upper yeah. echelon ipa right, right. That's so ridiculous so i went with this one you know but also because as i was saying to you you can learn a lot from a brewery about their pale ale how do, do they do it? Do they do a normal pale ale? Well, OK, then you're probably safe. They'll probably do other stuff. Well, if they don't do a normal pale ale well, or if they just load it with hops and call it a pale ale. Well, then you might be in for some trouble with that brewery. Might not. You know, maybe they don't know it brewing as well as you think they should. So I went with the pale ale. And uh, I'll let you go first. What do you think about hoof hearted? I'll take a nice sip from hoof hearted. <laughs> Which uh, you didn't mention from the tri-state area of Connecticut, which is not in our tri, not in our tri-state area of New York. Yeah. But anywho, um, it's not bad. Like, um, for me, like it, it, it's definitely not bad. It is really good. It's got a nice danky hoppiness to it, which you wouldn't expect from a pale ale. A slight more breadiness to it than you expect from an IPA, so you do definitely get that maltiness that you would from a pale ale. Mouth feels definitely more watery than an IPA. It's th- well, it's thinner. But it's pretty good. It's pretty enjoyable. It's it's not what I would consider the standard that I would like from a pale ale because I like a more traditional fine mix of like hoppiness with the maltiness and not being overwhelmingly malt. I mean, hoppy because that's, you know, why we have our West coast style IPAs. But that being said, it is a very good beer. I like it a lot. It's got a good balance for 6%. Very drinkable, very easy. I like, like, again, I like the fact that for a pale ale that they are kind of adventuring with the hops here, making it distinct from a standard pale ale. But at the same time, I think if you're looking for a, a pale, uh, pale ale, you might, you know, be conflicted with that like I am. So, but I do like it a lot. And I thank you for trying it. I love the can art on because the can art. And as we were on the website, kind of traipsing about looking at things. Uh, it's got this nice Mr. Pickles in like Super Jail, like artwork. And that's all their beer has. And it's really cool because. Yeah, yeah, nice. Nice consistency to their artwork and looks like they like sort of like mm. bright color throwback sort of ideas, uh, music. Um, it's all part of their influence. So pretty cool. I like it. Yeah. So this is my first time. I've never had a hoof hearted before on or off the show. Um, this one for a pale ale, I think is pretty good. It's very um, it's got a lot of flavor to it. So it's not sitting in that like weird scope of being a sort of like a session IPA. 
uh, without much of the flavor to it. It's definitely got the flavor. It's got a nice package of hops to it that may not be as pronounced as something in an IPA. So I think they do the pale ale style pretty well. Um, you know, some people not accustomed to pale ales or IPAs might still find this like particularly hoppy, I would say. Um, I think it's really good. It's not super strong, but it's, it is still 6%. So uh, you got to keep that in mind. But uh, I, I like it. I think they did a, a really good job with this. Got a nice like hazy quality to it. Um, very citrusy, very uh, aromatic. And uh, definitely would check out more again. I think this is a very quality brew. Definitely tastes top of the line in terms of pale ale and IPA style. So I would be interested in checking out more of them. Um, and potentially, you know, shelling out more big bucks for stuff like that. Cause I, I do think that they have a lot of potential and I, I like the ideas that they've got going on. So I would definitely check them out again. Um, again, like Martin said, not really part of our, they're not a huge, they don't have a huge distribution around us. Uh, I was lucky enough to find this at beer universe. Sometimes they have weird stuff that we don't generally get around here. And I believe I've never seen who've hearted anywhere else. Um, besides beer universe so i would definitely check it out again and see see what other kinds of uh, beers they get in there because it's definitely a quality quality beer from them it's pretty cool though i like trying out new things like that finding good stuff rare to find something good from connecticut <laughs> that's oh. not true that's where espn is headquarters oh well there you go <laughs> Bristol, Connecticut, and Titan Tower for WWE. Huh? Didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Let's go, Cody Rhodes, new champion. Didn't know that, but well, uh, yeah, Connecticut's got a couple of cool things, right? Yeah, I just said Bristol, where the ESPN's headquarters, and uh, WWE. Uh, it's can be in close proximity to uh, New York City. Yeah. In, hop the ferry and get some brooklyn <laughs> <clears throat> i don't know too much about connecticut though i've been there a couple times you know my friends live in connecticut um but your connecticut than, your connecticut white friends that's right other than that i don't know don't don't have a lot of experience with connecticut it's part of new england no one cares <laughs> that's the that's the correct answer it's part of new england nobody cares um all right let's talk about the omen the first, the first omen. omen that's right the, the first omen <laughs> the, the only one recognized on the show right now the omen from 1976 so yeah we we talked about this a little bit so before diving into the film sure david verner david warner is in this film yeah can you name other films that we have done that he was in you know i was actually uh <laughs> thinking about this because i definitely because i was looking at his filmography i'm like wow we've actually he snuck into quite a few of our apparent <laughs> apparently yes i'm cheating here because yeah i don't i i couldn't name anything off the top of my head but in the mouth of madness is mm -hmm. uh didn't realize that actually it can't can't he was, he's the doctor and uh it's been a really long time since i've seen that movie so like actually the last time is when we did it so i really i honestly don't remember it that well uh, so I, I'll need to go back and revisit that. Uh, I don't, I've drawn a blank on what other, what other movies, what, what else? He was in Straw Dogs as Henry Niles and he was uncredited. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Well, that wouldn't pass me by. I definitely wouldn't have picked that out for well, sure. Cause, cause he's, uh, you know, uncredited. So. Yeah. I, I don't even know, you know, and what that's referring to. He's in Scream 2. He's Is Gus, he's Gus Gold. Gus Gold. Such a memorable character. I've seen Scream a billion times, Scream 2 enough times. I don't know who the fuck, Gus who the fuck is Gus I... Gold. It doesn't. I mean, it's a memorable <laughs> name for sure. Gus Gold. Oh, and he oh, was in Body he's Bags. A... He's a fucking. <laughs> it's a drama teacher. It's her drama. Okay, okay, okay. All right, yeah, that and I mean, he was in body bags, huh? <laughs> he was Dr. That. Locke, <laughs> yeah, you know, so that you know, 
I could see him in Scream 2 now that you mentioned it. And to be honest with you, that sounds like a, it's a, actually a pretty important role because it does set up the whole idea of like her being mm-hmm. in the play. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. But no, I definitely no would never have in a million years been like, yeah. That's her drama. He's, he's her drama teacher from Scream 2. No, I definitely that one. All of these passing by, it seems like he's, you know, a lot of times he's got very minor, minor uh, roles in these things, but not in um, The Omen. Doesn't have a minor role no. in The Omen. He uh, also was only... in, uh, he's in a lot of Star Trek as well. Oh. He was uh, in the Star Trek Next Gen important episodes of Chain Command, which is a two parter. And he voiced Rachel Ghoul in the Batman animated series that you have taken. Seven years to watch. <laughs> yeah. I don't even think I've gotten to Ray Shao Ghoul yet uh, in that series, to be honest with you. Because I don't think he doesn't show up till uh, much later in the show. At least in the Max episodes, because there's a uh, differing uh, episode. Ordering. Numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah, that was say, was say, but yeah, before getting into the actual film discussion, that was kind of like when I was looking at like, David Ward. He seems familiar. I'm looking through I'm like, wow, he is snucked into so much yeah. stuff. Like he's just, you know, bam, bam, bam. Like, you know, the tried and true thespian, you know. Missed call. it. M- miss, missed it on those. I did not realize he was in all that stuff. But now that I. Well, neither did I it, either. That's yeah. the thing, too. It's like, what? Now that I see it, I can. Uh, I can. Um, PC him yeah. and other stuff. Uh, you know who we've never done, though, is Gregory Peck. Never had a Gregory Peck movie. Doing his finest Sam Waterston in this film. All he's missing is the eyebrows. And he's yeah, Jack he, Boy. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's doing a good job with that. That Gregory turtleneck. Peck. What do what, you think of that? Dude, the amazing 70s turtleneck. No, man. I, I don't, not even just the turtleneck, but in general, they gave him some fine uh, costumery in here. Because... He's got the turtlenecks. He's got the goddamn cashmere sweaters that he's pulling out every now and then with such a nice laid back casual look for a guy who has who's 60 years old with a fucking five year old demon child. Just (laughs) just standing in the hallway, you know, with his hands tucked into his slacks, looking so nice and casual in this movie. I love it. Pleated cashmere slacks too because they're all like you know silky i know i love the i love the the whole idea that this is like you know this is business cash for him because he's always got to be you know he's he's what the ambassador to london or to um, england yeah england so he's got to look you know always look presentable but at the same time he's at his house so he's looking nicely casual in his little sweater it's great it's great i love it yeah and then not only that but he's got that nice like um raincoat that he wears later on in the movie as he's you know when he's traipsing around graveyards and stuff like that it's like your normal business cash graveyard robbing outfit <laughs> oh, he's great in this but yeah so when we when we first meet up in the omen with gregory peck he's uh just been delivered some horrible news uh you know his wife was pregnant she's giving birth and they've lost the child and you know right away the doctor's like you know what not even doctor, priest. It's a priest of the. Oh yeah, that's true. The so priest, like and uh, yeah, you know what? You know, that's your first sign that something's gone wrong here. You <laughs> went to the priest and not the emergency room. Well, so of it's course, the, it's a hospital in Rome. So of course, exactly because at the time he's the ambassador to Italy. These assholes in Italy, they don't have real hospitals. They have, they have, you know. Catholics running and, it, and ruining the first, everything. The first question out of Gregory Peck should have been, "Well, how many <laughs> successful births have you guys had?" And you're like, uh, well, this would have been the first, but it's not. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so that's your first problem. But yeah, he he's confronted by him, and he says, basically, you know what? Sorry, we lost we lost the child. Took one breath and died. Yeah, and, and yeah, not, and not only that, but yeah, this priest is not very fucking comforting. He's not like you know taking him aside with a nice warm gesture and he's just sitting there like no oh, the kid dead <laughs> but anyways gregory peck's like my wife she's she's horrendous she's she's got the hysterics all the time she can't handle this news she's she will she won't survive it <laughs> so they cook up this scheme not the- even not even cook up he the priest suggested to him like we have another child looks no. just like your kid why don't you just fucking take this kid <laughs> and 
that's like should have been also Gregory Peck's second sign. Like the priest who is a priest is like, here, take this goddamn bastard child and you exactly. you, you do something with it. You know, uh, I know the whole the whole idea is like very, you know, it, obviously it's 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 for cinema. Right. But the whole idea itself is like makes you take a step back and be like, wait, 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 wait. Who's the mother that you're <laughs> taking this baby from? Oh, and, she's dead. She's yeah. Dead. And what and what 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 kind of half ass scheme are, is this? Where now I have to go and give this new baby to my wife. Just pretend like, yeah, these are ours. She didn't want to adopt, so you know what? We're just gonna we're just gonna lie and say this is her kid. When it grows up and it looks nothing like either of us, you know, it doesn't, <laughs> have, my, it doesn't have my bushy eyebrows. She's gonna question something, but at that point, it'll be too late. So she won't know. She's a woman. She's, she's ready. She's she's, she's, she's too prone to hysterics. I'll just she's tell her too something stu- else. She's too stupid to read. And do you get that feeling? Like, not that Gregory Peck in this movie is uh standoffish or anything like that, but it definitely has that male chauvinism element to it of like what he, what R- Robert says goes, right? Because like she's constantly throughout the movie looking at him, like, wait a second, where did this na- new nanny come from? I didn't order him, and he's like, I I just, just thought you did. I don't do any fucking shit around here <laughs> for the kid. I thought you would have ordered. You know, I just get that feeling for me throughout it, the movie. It is, but at the same time, like, out of all of these films, like, if you compare him to, like, Cassavetes and Rosemary's Baby, like, mm. he's, he's actually, like, you know, actually heartwarming because he does show genuine care for his wife, you know. And, that, and, and, say, I, and say he does show genuine care for his wife and that he does love her. But again, yeah, it's yeah. it's through a lens of like he's a 60 year old man in the 70s, of course. Like, yeah, it's misogynist. Yeah, I just love how how often the movie goes to him is like what he says goes. And, and, and it's, it's, she's just he's, constantly looking. Well, he's the ambassador. So, of course, that's so. true. That's so true. She, yeah, she's supposed to have his, you know, pipe and socks ready. You know, slippers, right? But I uh, was a little bit disappointed that the London uh, setting doesn't get used as much as it. I feel like it should. You know, like London back then in the sixties and seventies was a little bit different than it is today. I wish we had gotten a little bit more sightseeing. And I think you're. I think you're thinking more of like New York City crime ridden. (laughs) No, but we just don't. It doesn't really. Most of it, the movie doesn't take place outside of the the mansion. And then we go to Rome. Excuse me. So some of it takes place in like a, a Roman setting, but. Which is also a missed opportunity, too, because like when they're in the beginning and it's in Italy. Where's the Plitziotetsky? Where's like the Jallo <laughs> people running around with knives, like, you know, slitting each other's <laughs> sure. throats like that would have been great. But the one thing I did notice, too, is like, how come all these films? It's all about these assholes in Britain. It's true. You know, Wicker Man, Straw Dogs, this movie. It's always fucking when you go over to Britain that shit gets weird. That's right. It's it's probably because it's so foreign <laughs> <laughs> to us Americans. It's like, what? What do they do over there? So, yeah, I mean, besides the setting, though, you know, effectively, once we move to London, um, we have him in this this ambassador role. And so he becomes an important you know, political piece, but we really don't see much of his work because he's mostly dealing with Damien back at home. And uh, it's, it, it almost seems like cause they only show like a few different shots of him being at work. But one of the shots is like, I think they say something like, so about that Saudi Arabia trip or something mm-hmm. like that. And he's like, oh, I won't be able to go to that. Like I've got, I've got a private matter at home that I'm going to deal with. And you could see like they're they're looking like fucking pissed off at him. Being the ambassador, they're like, you're not going to fucking deal with this work. It's funny because I wonder how much work he's actually getting done dealing with Damien being at home. Because well, it doesn't fu- seem like he's doing a lot. Well, the funniest thing, too, is they're reporting on him, like taking pictures and shit of him. Like he's a rock star. Or like, or like, <laughs> yeah, a, like, or like a major political figure. Like he's like, yeah. like you know, the secretary of state. No, he's just an ambassador. Well, that's, yeah, that's David Warner's character, right? The, the yeah. guy with the fucking bowl cut. <laughs> the ter- the ter- the terrible mullet bull yeah. cut, cut of the seventies, and he's just sitting there taking pictures of everything. And, but no, they're like, oh yeah, the ambassador is doing this, the ambassador is doing that. And it's like, you know how many Im- 
embassies Britain has? I know. A, a lot. So, like, what the American ambassador to Britain's doing is really probably, like, registering it all and, like, the importance of, like, uh, gossip and politics of the United States or Britain. So, it's, I mean, it's, like, it's funny. Like, be like, oh, my, like, to think, like, oh, he's so important. Yeah, I agree. Like, why Why do they – they wouldn't really care that much about this guy. Like, people would be like, who? Who the fuck is this Thorn guy? Yeah, I don't he's, even know. Yeah, exactly. He's an ambassador, so he'd be, like, low level, like, nobody, like, you know, he wouldn't be getting that level of attention. Yeah. Um, I think, like, with the one thing that is really interesting about this opening moment, though, because you – we really – you don't get to see a lot of Damien – until after they make it to London. Uh, you see a little bit, and he's getting escorted around by his, you know, like, whatever it is, like a nanny or governess, whatever you call it in, in Britain. Um, but when we do see him, uh, it's to, it's at the, the most recent thing is is uh, at the birthday party. So, And the birthday party is probably one of the most cited uh, moments of the omen in terms of, you know, its eeriness, its spookiness. Uh, because it does have this lead up to it of being like, there's all kinds of like sentimental score going on in like a montage of photographs of Damien and his mother and father, like traipsing around the sunset on the fields and moors uh, and um, like attending a fair and stuff like that. And then eventually you you lead up to this moment at the birthday party. It's like, wow, look at this great family. They they must be so happy together. And then, you know. Having a goddamn carnival for their son's birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Inviting every single, you know, kid from the ambassadorship, apparently. And uh, they've, you know, they've got her na- his nanny there. And uh, w- one thing that I kind of find interesting about this scene is like that opening where uh, Damien is with Holly. The, the his nanny governess whatever you want to call her and then his mom comes up to her like really weirdly like i find it strange in this particular scenario because there's really nothing leading into this moment that makes you think like oh you know holly's kind of weird or uh we don't even know holly really we've seen her like one time and then there's that w- weird confrontation that she has with holly where she's like i'll take him give him to me and Holly's like, all right, all right I'll, I'll give them over to you. I found that a little bit strange, like almost like we missed a scene. Like there was supposed to be something that we're, we were meant to see and then we didn't end up seeing it. Did you feel that same like, way? Yeah, the show was some kind of conflict. Yeah. yeah. It, just makes her, it just makes the, you know, uh, Lee Remick look like a bitch. Yeah. For no reason. Yeah, it was, it's just like weirdly confrontational. Because at that point, we haven't really seen anything weird. We don't really know why she's being so standoffish about it. It's just like. Holly's kind of has him and she's getting her picture taken by the photographer. Mm. But other than that, it's just kind of a weird moment, but then it makes sense. Cause she, you know, she goes off, goes into the house and calls out to Damien. Hey, Damien, look at me. I'm up here. going to fucking, you know, put, put a noose around my neck. Isn't that mm-hmm. fun? <laughs> this is all for you, Damien. It's all for you. I mean, what do you think about that scene? Is it, a, do you think it's an eerie scene still? Does it work? Yes, especially because when she does it, and she does it with such glee, and mm. uh, Holly P- uh, Paylance does a great job. Like, you know, it's very understated, but, like, gleeful, and just like, what the hell? And then the fact that when she jumps off, and this is something I learned from the interview from the Screen Factory Blu-ray, is she was just originally supposed to jump off, like, in the script, uh, it's just she's supposed to jump off and be hung. Dick Donner decided to have her smash into the window too. That's fucking yeah. awesome. Like, a that's good, like a, a, good that's a yeah. great like it, subtle it gives it a, a physicality, right? Yeah, like it gives a, it a real like crunch and like you know yeah. depth to it that's like you wouldn't think about. Like and because like again like you know I can see there being like a director or producer on there and like she jumps off and like okay cool and it's like fuck I mean she's jumping off and hanging herself wouldn't her body fucking swing back into the window yeah. and go crashing through it and yep it's it gives a nice physicality there's that other shot too of like the other maid in the house who's yeah like, yeah so, and then you have the kids all you have all the kids staring like what the fuck like you know <laughs> and that what? shot of the clown too it's cool with it's, it's cool. It's awful like... with that awful <laughs> not meant for children 70s makeup <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah the like yeah. the grease paint like i've just yeah. come from chimney sweeping sort of <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> but yeah, no, that I I do think it still holds up. I, th- yeah. I still think uh, it's rather good. I, eerie, I wouldn't say it holds up as being like eerie still. Like it's, but it's a nice touch. I do think it works pretty well. Yeah, I think I think you know Holly's pretty really good. It, that's really her only scene, but she's mm-hmm. really good about selling that moment and uh, just the disconcerting element of her. You know, having to go through the whole process, walk all the way up to the house, go up through the house, into the into the house, through the window, out with the noose, and still make that decision. It's it's really a nice moment to the movie, which I don't. I it's been a while since I've seen the uh, the remake, but I don't feel like that was portrayed as well in the remake of that whole scenario happening. But um, this one's really good. I I can definitely see at the time too how that would be pretty uh, unsettling for audiences to see that you know the children being involved and things like that, which was often very taboo at the time. Um, I like it a lot. I like that scene. I think, I think it works really well. And uh, you know, that's, that really leads us into that idea of like, well, there's probably something wrong with Damien, but who knows, right? Like there's some, some wackos out there too. And uh, I like when they get the new nanny. Cause the new nanny to me is off is like off putting itself like right away when you meet her. And they're just like, huh? She seems interesting. It's like, <laughs> this ain't Mary Poppins, but she certainly seems like a different type of woman, but we'll, we'll take her in. And she's like, so interested in going to see Damien. It's like, nowadays you'd probably be like, Hmm, is that a pedophile? <laughs> you, you know, like they really also, are interested in my son. So what's funny is too, again, to recall back to the screen factory, Blu-ray that you lent me with the interview. So when they were interviewing, uh, the writer, uh, David Seltzer, about it. He had originally written the role to be some buxom, beautiful lady. Mm. And, but they had casted her, and he's like, that's not what we talked about, Dick. Like, what's going on here? And she's like, she's fucking great. She's fucking great. Like, look how fucking evil she is, it mm. seems. She's like the center of evil in here. Yeah, but like, and Dave's like, if that lady showed up to your house and said she was the nanny, you'd call the cops. Like, right. And right, Dick, right. Said, Dick said, write something to make it work. And that's how you get the line of them walking around. Like, excuse me. Excuse me. But no one, we didn't, we didn't call for you. No, not what I, what it was called for you. She's like, oh, I'm from the agency. And they're like, oh, the agency. Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. And then, <laughs> and then no one follows up after. She gives yeah. them the references and then. You know, Lee Remick's character, Catherine, is kind of like feeling sheepish now. Like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was do you, taking do you think, my. Do you think, though, like that's like kind of like like a Rosemary's Baby effect of like where like the evil is kind of influencing them? Because they say yeah. like, oh, yeah, we're going to follow up on it. And then you, you're, they never do. Like, you know. Yeah, I do. I mean, like, I think that Billy Whitelaw does a really good job as Mrs. Baylock, though, of coming off of like, you know, because. You think about it, Gregory Peck's a very powerful character in this movie, as we talked about. You know, he's he's always the dominant force. He's an ambassador here. He seems like a very important character. So when Mrs. Baylock is saying, uh, you want to get rid of the dog? Like, I don't think that's such a good idea. And kind of back talking yeah. him. It's kind of impressive, right? Like, she she definitely does a good job of si- standing her ground yeah. and being impressive. To the point where you're almost like, what the fuck, Gregory Peck? Throw her the fuck out of the house. You know, like she, you know, give her a nice backhand and tell her to stop sassing. Because it's, you know, I, I'm joking about that, of course. But, but you know. A- for, Atticus Fitch, also known for his surroundings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because, you you know, cause you ex- you almost expect that. You know, like, like for him to say, like, get rid of the fucking dog. No. <laughs> you know, but, uh. Yeah, he does it. And I think that's uh, that's kind of to Billy Whitelaw's credit that she does such a good job. You know, I do think that now when you think about it, like looking at Mrs. Baylock as the character, you kind of already suspect it. Um, and that I don't know if that were, was the case back in the 70s where you're like, hmm, this lady seems like she's fucking weird. But, uh, you know, you do now. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing for the movie. It doesn't really end up being that much of a I don't think it impacts it. Whether, yeah, you, wh- yeah. whether she's somebody that you know. I mean, because like not long after that you find like she mentions how she's there to protect Damien, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, th- and you get the more, Rick Dost! <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not like, it's like that, like, like a hidden secret. Like you're supposed to find out in like the third act. Like it was you. Like, you know, like, you know. yeah. And uh, yeah, that's the thing too, about the omen. I don't really think that it holds its secrets very close to itself anyway. You know, it, it definitely 
um you know the there's nothing there's nothing about this movie where it's like you're not supposed to know like mm-hmm. yeah damien's fucking antichrist uh people are you know basically slaves to him and trying to help him out wherever he goes and stuff like that doesn't really hold those secrets you kind of just like find them out as they go along but there's nothing that's really kept for you to the end i guess the biggest one that i think is actually really cool is the whole f- photography of the priest who keeps bugging um gregory peck who's like keeps showing up like almost like looks like he's like a drunken idiot <laughs> he's like very like disheveled <laughs> disheveled looking for a priest and you're like what i've been on the whiskey is? all night and i've been exactly. seeing <laughs> exactly and uh you know like but i think it's really cool that whole idea of like taking the photograph and you see the spear like mm. uh drawing closer each time in the photograph yeah like manifesting yeah i thought that i think that's a really cool idea that works very well in this movie and you know like signifies it's a weird like dynamic of like what's what's fate what's um already preordained i think that works really well um and not only that but you know what it also signifies one big thing is that this man forgot his nice little derby cap and that's one of the reasons why he was murdered in that park, you know, because you see you see him walking away from the chair and he's left his derby, little nice little derby cap on the chair, on the on the stool or bench or whatever. I like how too yeah. in that whole scene, uh, the greatest hurricane ever hits England. <laughs> it's like, like, yeah. <laughs> just... yeah, yeah, it's a pretty big, big, big storm, and then no one notices it. Um. What do you think about so like we we talked about the priest and and all that idea. What do you, how do you think that the omen um tackles religion, Christianity specifically because in the exorcist religion is a really big uh in in specifically catholic christianity is a very big uh element to its whole plot. Like, you know, it becomes a big focal point. In the omen uh, specifically for me i feel like religion kind of takes a backseat here and it does deal with it but not to the same uh, extent to w- how exorcism movies um deal with religion specifically catholicism ca- catholic religion um uh, moving forward in different movies how do you feel that this movie tackles that yeah no the was catholicism here definitely takes a backseat it's more of a vehicle to move things f- f- the story forward um, I don't think um, the story is really interested in digesting and making any like statements on Christianity in of itself. It's just being like, uh, again, and this is from watching the interview with David Seltzer from the Screen Factory. He said the only reason that he even was interested in doing this is because he, uh, when he was asked to do like an exorcist type film to write one, he's like, I'm an atheist. I don't give a shit about any of this. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, well, if I can learn something, that's pretty cool. And then by reading the Bible, he's like, there's a lot of weird shit in here. That's, you know, <laughs> yeah. c- could make for a good story. So I think, I think it's definitely got the, the trappings of something that literally is like just taking the most, like kind of like sensational parts mm-hmm. and the most, you know, how can I make this into something that's going to be gripping effect like there's no nothing here that if you were to watch this film you would gather and say is like an indictment on like any christian dogma it's just it's just using the theology as a vehicle to move the story from a to b yeah and i i think it's interesting i kind of like it because for the most part a lot of exorcism (laughs) movies specifically are, are one centered around the devil uh are very much aligned with catholicism well, because exorcism is not a Protestant belief, we don't. Right, we don't. I, we don't do that nonsense. Okay? But I mean, I, I mean, like, like Christianity <laughs> itself is sort of like the redemption in all of those movies, where it's not. It's not a question whether there is the opposite side of the devil, right? It's always yeah. Catholic Christianity, and um, I think that that's it. it. The exorcist believer actually tried to do that a little bit. Didn't do it really successfully because it uh, made like an Avenger style team of fucking religious uh, figures. But oh, you didn't you didn't hear the music playing like dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I know dun, dun. It, it tried to do that. And I thought that was a cool idea at the time. But yeah, most movies 
centered around this. They they definitely have this sort of good versus evil battle where it's like fucking Christianity reigns, bitch. If you have any other religious belief, then you're gonna you're gonna lose this battle with the devil. So I think that it's interesting that the omen really doesn't come down like that. It you know it certainly has Catholic Christianity in it. But it's not to the extent where it's like, oh, it's the end all be all. This is how you have to succeed and win against the devil. And actually, it kind of makes, you know, especially the priest himself, they, they he looks like a quack. He's like fucking <laughs> drink the blood. <laughs> you know, like when he shows up, he basically just says like eat the flesh, drink the blood. It's like, dude, don't open your 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 pitch. yeah your pitch with this or or well, also you know the jews head to zion like again yeah, like yeah. no <laughs> maybe not the best fucking opening to, to hear. you know what i mean like no the, which which gregory peck even says as he's like saying that like there's when the jews return to zion he's like yeah israel what are you talking about he's like I, I and you drink Go to communion and drink the blood, and he's like, "All right, shut the hell up!" Like it's like, <laughs> exactly. yeah, it's like, yeah, don't you know? Maybe yeah. don't read from the Book of Revelation. Just it's, feel like it's it's not the best <laughs> the best start to to try to get him swayed. So I think like I I, I like what the Omen does with that because I don't think it really falls on either side too heavily. You know, I guess noting the existence of the devil does indicate some sort of religious doctrine, but other than that, I think it does a pretty good job of abstaining from coming down on either side or like saying like Catholic Christianity is the way to go, which is most of the time what happens in exorcist movies. Uh, and even like, you know, the conjuring stuff like that, which doesn't really have like a religious bent to it. It still ends up coming down on like Catholic Christianity. So it's kind of cool. Um, the other thing that I noted too, in this movie that I think is like kind of a really interesting dynamic that it has, you could read this movie in a couple different ways, you can read it like really literally just like, Oh yeah, it's fucking based on actresses stuff. <laughs> but the, the thing that I think that's really interesting, especially as a parent, I got to bring that in here. Um, <laughs> is the fact that like it, it dives into themes about your kid growing up and you, you know, you try to raise them a certain way and then you don't recognize how they're growing up. You're like, why are they like that? <laughs> it kind of brings up that idea of like, you know, it's not, not literally a, the, the son of the devil, but they are certainly becoming their own person in a way that you're not really, um, you don't really love. Right. So it kind of reminds me of sort of the, the issues that are going on right now, like parents of, uh, mass shooters, right? Like, <laughs> did they do the right thing? Do they do the wrong thing? I think in a lot of cases you can obviously see that they did the wrong thing, but it raises, <laughs> it raises a good point. At least in the omen is like, what do you do when you're, you know, your son, you don't recognize as the person that you, you wanted to raise and they become something else, uh, something worse than you wanted. I think that's an interesting idea. What, what do you think about that for the omen? I mean, I think it's okay. I mean, I think, I don't think the parenting part is really. Uh, I don't think that, we see much parenting, to be honest with you. Well, yeah, cause <laughs> to be fair, because there's nannies, or as you like to call them, governesses here. The one thing uh, I, I like too is like when he shuts the curtains when they're finding the new house and they're getting, you know, they get in the mansion. He's like, yeah. "We're gonna fuck, we're gonna fuck right now." I don't care if the nanny's out there taking care of Damien. Well, he's originally like, "Oh, we're gonna go upstairs and fuck," and she's like, "Well, there's no furniture up there," and he's like. I guess we'll fuck it. <laughs> I love it though. It's just like it would be so nice if you just be like, "What you missed? What? Which? What you missed was the six, uh, sixty-year-old Gregory Peck spending twenty minutes being like, all right, let me get down.' I know. Yeah, <laughs> knees popping. No <laughs> Viagra back then either. So I need a nice stiff drink. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I don't. I don't think the film's like it. Like the, it. Like has anything interesting to say about parenting or anything. Is again. It's the Antichrist. They adopted the Antichrist. Unbeknownst to, you know, the wife, but Gregory Pacquiao took in the Antichrist. And I think it's more, you know, saying more something about, you know, uh, just evil incarnate itself. So you see the overtness of it. Yeah, it's it's very much, you know, being like, look, it's literally the devil. Because I think, I, I think, because I think the film, the film is very explicit. I, I do know from the, like, not from just the, the Blu-ray interviews, but 
Richard Donner wanted the film to be more ambiguous, to be, is it about, like, is it just a weird coincidence of accidents tied to this kid, or is he really the Antichrist? And this is one of the few times I'd say having that vague idea is stupid. Because what the hell would that even mean? All these people died, but the kid's fucking there, and they think he's the Antichrist, but is he really? Who knows? That's fucking stupid. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the end result, you know, is definitely le- way less ambiguous, probably than. No, 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 than, no, no, no. They they ended up they ended up being explicit by the end. But I know Richard Donner, as he originally tended when he was wanting to direct the film, he wanted it to be more ambiguous. But I think that's kind of stupid because, like, what, like, so what do you say, like, what, like. Oh, all these people died horrible deaths on this wild goose chase because they think this kid's a little shit. <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, I'm a little mm. scamp, you know, I mean, compared to like him actually being like the Antichrist. Just, yeah. Everybody dies in this film in such ways that aren't like, oh, that's really random. Like, there's just way, it's way, you know, the evidence is set up to be way too coincidental yeah it's literally final destination yeah, yeah it is yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean especially david Warner's that that's definitely final destination yeah. ask uh it's really cool it's like it's nice mm-hmm. nice little setup there of the him glass being... the glass sliding off the truck and slicing <laughs> his head head right off oh that's awesome Pretty that's horrific. What, like, it's great look yeah. i mean grant granted you can totally see like the puppeting like you know like you know the doll sure. and sure but yeah. it, it, but i mean Looks great and it executed great. Yeah, incredibly visceral. It's awesome. I love yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the explicitness is definitely you know better for the movie in terms of actually drawing that conclusion that like no, nah, it's 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 Damien. You know, it's it's the Antichrist here. <laughs> um, I think like I think the interesting elements uh during the sequence where they actually are investigating, like so they go to Rome, they're trying to find out, um where Damien actually came from because they don't know right they don't have any history on him uh there was mysterious fire that burned down all the information about who the kid was um what I love too is like when they're at the old hospital where he was born and he's at you know Gregory Peck's asking the nun like what happened and stuff and then you see you know David Warner pop up he's like I was on the third floor nothing but ashes it's like no one's cleared that out. They yeah, just let, the ashes are them, still there. They just left the bottom of this hospital to be burned out, and <laughs> like, just like, like a, like just some weird Mario left. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? I also love the the elevator that we'd never see anymore, where yeah. she just hops on and like whoop, <laughs> takes her away. And not uh, only that, she doesn't say ciao. She says prego. I w- I love that though because like I was just imagining like somebody just times it just incorrectly and like crushed <laughs> you know it's fucking no wonder we don't have those types of elevators anymore constantly running um I think the the cool part like I I honestly I think that the investigation kind of runs a little bit long uh, a, little, a little too long there sometimes it's a little it's one of those things in the seventies that uh, a lot of these types of movies did. Um, where they they ran just a little long with like the mm-hmm. investigation scheme of it. Uh, the Changeling is another one, which is a really good movie, really good supernatural movie, but at the same time, runs a little long on how it investigates the actual events. Um, here, I think that probably the most interesting is is when they go to the cemetery and they they open up the graves and they see like what the fuck? It's like a fucking animal in this grave. Like he was birthed from an animal, mm-hmm. and you kind of get that. You know, you you heard him try to say that earlier on in the movie where he says, Jack, Jack. And then, you know, you don't know what he's talking about. And then later on, it's revealed to you. Oh, he meant jackal. It's a jackal that he was birthed from, which. It's kind of an interesting idea. I don't I've now I don't know if I've ever heard biblically something like birth from a jackal. I don't know. If, I don't I'm not really studied on my Bible. I did take Bible studies. And I studied very specific areas of the Bible, but I didn't study birth from a jackal. I don't remember that. Um, but I think it's a cool idea. And then not only that, but the, the better part, which I think would have been extremely disconcerting, is when they open up the baby's grave and they see like the baby's head bashed, the skull bashed in. It's a really nice little touch where he, you know, obviously he's very uh, upset by that because he's, they told him, oh, your baby just died. You know, no, no, your baby didn't die. He was bludgeoned, you know. He bashed his skull in and then gave you a fucking antichrist baby. Um, I think that's pretty cool. I think it's uh, it works really well. Um, it's very atmospheric, 
then you get like all the Rottweilers or whatever they are. Is that yeah, what they are? Rot- Rottweilers. Yeah, Rottweilers. Yeah. Nice big beefy boys. <laughs> Poor Rottweilers. They got really bad uh, rap. Probably, probably they probably did after this film. That's why, like mm-hmm. people. Yeah, because because like, my Rottweilers protect say, the my, Antichrist. <laughs> I say my because I say my grandfather had a Rottweiler and uh, her chew toy was a giant tire. And it was <laughs> great. Like, Go get the tire. The tire be on chain. Like grab this big truck tire and pick it up. Like, oh, <laughs> That Rottweiler was uh, practicing uh, fucking, uh, what do you call it? The, the what's the fucking gym? Um, CrossFit. CrossFit. Yeah. Yeah. They're, he, that Rottweiler was practicing CrossFit before CrossFit was a thing. Mm-hmm. Throwing tires around. It's nice. Well, because CrossFit's a cult. Um, what did you think about the? monastery bit with the well gus ring we, basic with I mean, where, yeah where you, where, you, where you see the the priest that originally yeah, yeah now he's burned i loved the fact that like, gregory uh, sorry, walks in yeah, there and he fucking like, puts his, he's like i can't even bear to look at you you're so fucking <laughs> disgusting you know he puts his mouth makes his, his fucking, hand up to his mouth like fucking hector ooh. salamanca down there like <laughs> ringing his bell like ting, 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 ting. what i find interesting too is like no doctor removed his eye. His eye is all fucked. Yeah, well, like, that eye is fucked. And they people what, were just like, let it be melted in there. <laughs> you know? It's like, well, that's what they said. The doctor's like, I can't do anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is a, another point to not going to Roman healthcare. Do not seek healthcare <laughs> in Rome. They leave your fucking eye fucked. <laughs> they just, you know. They just, you know, no eye patch like, or anything. It's they're like, like yeah, just... yeah, they're like, have an ammo right over some biscotti. <laughs> exactly. yeah, be... I can't do anything with it. It's fucked. Be on your way. <laughs> that's what I, I uh, that's what I took from from that scene. But yeah, I, I did like it too. Yeah, when he's just like visibly like disgusted by <laughs> the sight of this priest. I'm just like, yeah. And the other priests are just like, yeah, I don't know. He lives here. We don't know what the fuck he's doing. You know, he doesn't talk much. He's pretty good at solitaire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and he's also, you know, he's very good at his, uh, you know, his, his, uh, what, what do they call that? The, the, your, your silent, your right of silence or whatever that, you know, the uh, priests do something. I was going to say your, his calligraphy. Yeah, yeah that too. Though. Yeah. What, what do you think of the uh, Damien riding his tricycle into the mom and she's like slips off and. Yeah, it's a pretty iconic scene, right? The. The idea, you know, like, it, you know, again, I think that's an interesting moment where you have the idea, the two ideas, right? The Richard Donner saying, I don't really want it to be too explicit. And then you have sort of the opposite idea is like, well, we need it to be kind of explicit. You know, we need, we need mm-hmm. the, the audience to think like, yeah, no, Damien is the Antichrist. So I think this is kind of a meeting in the middle where it's sort of like, oh, there's a preordained element to it. Like she, all of these things kind of, um, happening at one time like unlucky but also at the same time damien fucking rides his trike into her and then then you have him leaning over and is like not helping her not yeah. screaming not upset at all just looking at her while she slips off the balcony well, uh, i say the the maid who's his gatekeeper opens the door yeah she and go. she yeah she she yeah. lets him go on flying on out yeah. yeah um yeah no i like the scene i think it's it's pretty cool um i think that the uh the shooting of it now though doesn't work as well because it looks like it's only like a f- four foot fall it's like yeah oh, no, no yeah it does that would have been is. uncomfortable i fell on some goldfish but <laughs> <laughs> otherwise <laughs> i'm okay you know i, I well, wrist, well, wrist I mean, sprained, was, but well say she was pregnant too so you know maybe mm. she probably still has you know the miscarriage but true I mean, true yeah and that's the thing too that i was thinking at the time when i was watching this movie it's like fucking Buddy, Gregory Peck, you're six years old. Why don't you just try to keep it down a little bit? Maybe not get your wife knocked up every now have and you, then. Have you thought about maybe the reason why the Antichrist is coming is because they're having kids at 1640? Exactly, exactly. Like they're, it's like, they're, sp- they're sperm and eggs are just like, so mutated from know, old age. <laughs> especially with Catholicism, it's like, all right, I know that the idea is to, you know, progenic, you know, you have to create children but you've gotten to a point now where it's it's a little bit too much all right just let it go it's like you know should have started earlier if that's what you wanted (laughs) 
But yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, I think it's interesting. What I find funny too about her actually getting hurt and she's getting wheeled into the hospital bed, right? And he's saying like, he's already gone and investigated in Rome at this time. Yeah. And he's already found out a whole bunch of shit. He's talked to the priest and everything. And she comes in and she says, I feel like I'm crazy, but I feel like Damien's nuts. You know, like something's wrong with Damien. And he just gaslights her. He's like, oh, everything's going to be okay, honey. He doesn't say anything about like, no, no, Damien is a fucking antichrist. I just found out about it. He just lets her think she's fucking crazy. Like, no, 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 no. He's like, yeah, that sounds familiar, but I'm not quite sure. No no need to be hysterical about this now. I know you just, you know, you just lost a baby and you've got internal bleeding damage and you probably will never have kids again, but let's not be hasty now. (laughs) Uh, What do you think about Gregory Peck's last name being Thorn and this tying into Halloween sex? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the cult of thorn no yeah i mean it's kind of you funny, know what though. yeah i i never made that connection until now <clears throat> yeah i don't know if there is a connection <laughs> but it is an interesting one no um, it's that de- there's definitely a connection because that's that totally has to be the reason why they called it <laughs> thorn. yeah i mean i think it's funny <laughs> like i think that it is interesting though like the the element of thorn i think that's that is interesting like the thorn in your your family tree um it's it's a nice idea, Damien Thorn. Um, I like it, and Bring I also. Wait, yeah, no, go ahead. no, I was I'm just out. gonna say. <laughs> I was just gonna say. I think that it's. In, I I wanted. To, I want to be at the casting for this movie, because I I want to be when they cast Damien, and they were like, we want, you know, your little cherubic faced children who also look like they could be absolute shits. Because, like, they did do a really good job of casting Damien in this movie where he looks like, yeah, he's kind of cute, right? He's like, he's kind of a cute little five-year-old. But then, you know, he has that face, that little, like, chubbiness to it that, that looks, like, very mischievous. Mm. I think they did a good job. And, and not only that, but, like, you know, Damien himself did a good job of selling up the fact that, like, yeah, he looks kind of nice, but he also looks like he could be, you know, an asshole. And <laughs> they get that, you know, you get get both sides from him. I like I he does a good job. Harvey Stevens does. Um what's great is from uh watching the interview to get uh with David Seltzer when he's talking about the script. He said he did not write in Damien looking at the camera at the end, and that was uh, a Dick Donner call, but he didn't have him look at it, he didn't call for it. He said, Now Damien, look away from the camera, look away from the camera, and then he's like do you ha- you got spicy farts or something? He's like, he's like, no, oh, squi- squishy farts. You got squishy farts. You got squishy farts. Do you? And he kept saying like squishy farts behind the camera until he turned around. He's like, oh, you got squishy farts. And- <laughs> so that was like the greatest thing ever. Finding out that like you know Damien turning and looking at the camera like I'm a little scamp. Like yeah, I'm gonna take over the world. Is because Dick Donner was sitting there saying you got squishy farts, yeah. don't you? <laughs> Squishy farts definitely makes you shiver, so I can understand. I can understand is a plum there. Yeah, I mean, so so what do you think about uh, you know overall the omen in terms of its staying power? Um, you know, you talked a little bit about how it's kind of uh, receded from public view, and we did get the first omen here. So obviously, there's some oh. some people that are well. Do you, well, do you think it's? Have, do you think? I mean, because again think back to our youth i feel like the omen was uh kind of much more cited back in the day and used as like a cultural touch point than it is now like Mm. yeah i mean it's hard to say though too because obviously looking back at that time the omen was that much less old in terms you know like now you think about it and the omen now is like to us what like 1950s movie <laughs> you know my 1950s movies would be now um for for people growing up so i it's hard to say for me now if it's because it's if it's receding because um it's just that much more aged or if it's because people just don't really recognize it as a movie anymore i don't i don't really know you know it's hard to say i think like the exorcist still has that sort of staying power and that's, 
I think there's a couple different things. I mean, I think partially one of it is just because it's been so heralded. Like, The Omen was critically acclaimed, but it's not been heralded the same way that The Exorcist is like, oh, it's the scariest movie you'll ever mm-hmm. see. Um, so there's that element to it where people growing up are like, oh, well, I've got to watch The Exorcist because people said it's the scariest movie I'll ever see. And, you know, now, obviously, they're going to be let down. They're going to be let down. I would just say it. The Exorcist is a great movie. They're going to be let down when you say it's the scariest movie they'll ever see. Because I don't necessarily believe that. Um, So I, I'm not really sure. I think The Omen does still work really well. I think that all parts of it are still very good uh, for viewers. I don't think that there's anything that really dates it too awfully. Um, You know, David Warner's haircut, maybe. Um, <laughs> and maybe, you know, that sweater that uh lee remick wears there at, at one point the, like the the pattern sweater but other than that there's nothing here that really dates it too awfully bad where i think like oh people wouldn't you know appreciate the movie for what it is so i don't really know i mean i think maybe the first omen will be a revival for the omen uh, to kind of come back a little bit um what's surprising to me too is that this movie has not had a 4k release um you know in this scheme of things at for pretty much every other movie around this time from the 1970s that is similar in critical acclaim has had a 4k release. You know, you've got the Exorcist that just got a 4k release. You've got uh, the changeling. that got a 4k release. The omen is one that's been left out. So that is surprising to me. Um, looks great. Even in 1080. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it looks great. I just think that, you know, a 4k could even, bump it up that much more in the dark places uh hdr added to it but you know it's it is surprising that that hasn't happened yet so you know maybe maybe there is less of a call for it i don't know but uh, i think it still does a really good job today um i don't think it's that dated no it definitely stands the test of time I, like i said it's just funny because like every now and then when we do one of these type of films that were when we were younger just totally still in the zeitgeist and it's something that like again even before even seeing this film, you know, I n- knew the whole Damien, I'm doing this all for you, Damien. And then the season one, like South, oh, geez, I don't know, I just fell down. But uh, the season one of South Park episode of, uh, you know, when Damien the Antichrist returns and it's Rick Dust Dominus, and then Satan fights Jesus, you know. Right. Yeah, and I mean the score I think is probably still pretty uh recognizable. Uh that that whole idea is still uh very uh, you know, it's a motif that still works. Um, Jerry Goldsmith pumping out another 70s score left and right. <laughs> yeah. Just, just Yeah. Just... And, and the idea of uh like the 666 too. Yeah. Um I think that's still, you know, pretty prevalent. The, I think that's a pretty. I think that is something that's pretty cool is the fact that his uh, uh, disciples all had that six 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 birthmark. But when Gregory Peck goes down to Israel to find out, like you know, he has no birthmark. He's like, check the hair, mm-hmm. and he cuts some of his hair, and it's like, oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a cool idea of you know it's it's on him. Um, I like that, and I like I like too how they they first think like, oh, was it like a like a concentration camp tattoo, Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of interesting. what did you think of the end? I like the end. I think that it works well, you know, um, it, it, it sort of has that like night of the living dead element to it of, uh, you have the well-meaning person and then the people who don't understand. And then, you know, it, it ends literally with a bang and, and being taken out. Um, but at the same time, you can totally understand. He's like, this is a fucking crazed man driving around London in a car uh, and then trying to, you know, murder his own son. So you could definitely see what the elements that go into that. And I think it works. I think it works well. I, I don't really see there being any other type of ending. I don't really see the the ending where he successfully gets rid of Damien. Um, what do you think? Well, that would mean less sequels. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really see an end where there's like a con- nice, convenient, like, oh, yep, he did it. Like, no problem. Antichrist has been uh, murdered and crisis averted. You know, it just it obviously leaves it up for sequels, and you know, 
I, I think I, I do think that's the right ending, though. I think to have it end on, you know, Gregory Peck uh, triumphing at the end, especially re- because he's, you know, such the doubter the entire time. Yeah, you know, I think the fact, you know, that he does end on losing and, you know, because he was too stubborn to listen to others the mm-hmm. entire time, mm-hmm. you know. And not only that, it but, works much, works much, you know, it's much more effective. Sure. And, and it also, you know, kind of steals the idea that like, well, the Antichrist is not that easy to vanquish. Mm. Like some <laughs> random guy who just, you know, listens to a priest every now and then. And gets if he's able to command a truck in a truck's e-brake all the way down <laughs> in goddamn Israel to have a fucking piece of glass cut some dude's head off, like, you know. Yeah. But that was also the funniest thing too is like when they're having like their fight in the in like Damien's bedroom and the uh Mrs. Baylock's like jumping on his back like ah! it's like it's like thinking like good thing they set up that he'd been bitten by a bunch of rabid Rottweilers not that long ago because Gregory Peck should just like fucking suplex this bitch and be on his I know. Yeah, way. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, his <laughs> arm impaled on a nice cemetery gate yeah. stake. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh yeah, I mean I like the ending. I think that it works really well. I think like it's it is the only the only real ending that could be pursued. I think um, it wouldn't make sense to have it any other way. And then you you get that nice setup of like oh he's been adopted by the president. So like yeah. you know that's that's its own set of complications, um, which I think works pretty. Which well. is funny that they have a state funeral for him and his wife. Agreed. Yeah, I know because he they, he was shot. He, yeah, I mean, trying to murder him, so you shouldn't yeah, you have would, this. You would think that pomp and, they, it, it would, there it wouldn't be pomp and circumstance behind it. It would be a nice, quiet, like whoops, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, nice burial. But uh, yeah, no, not not to the extent that he gets there. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree that is weird. But uh, other than that, I, I like that. I like the ending. I think it works really well. Goddamn Carter administration. <laughs> um. Anything else? Anything? Else I think that's about I that. Think we I covered think we, it. I, yeah, I think we I think we went through it. So, so I have a scale. Okay, go. And if you have a better one, let me know. On no. a scale of one to ten, Gregory Peck, cumbersome turtlenecks. Hmm. What would you give the Omen? Um. Yeah, I would probably give it. I would give it an eight out of ten. I think it's a really good movie. I think that it definitely has a lot of staying power, even, you know, despite its age. I think that uh, watching it now, it still, you know, has a nice impact. Um, it do- like I And like we talked about earlier, I don't think that this feels like just another copycat of Exorcist, which there are a lot of those. Uh, this is not one of them. You know, it obviously has that element of like uh, the devil and demons and things like that. But to that extent, I think that's where kind of the – the copycat to the exorcist ends. This is its own thing. It, it inspired its own offshoots of, you know, demon antichrist kids. And, uh, I think it does a good job of, you know, segmenting itself from the exorcist. So, uh, with that said, I think like most of the movie is pretty engaging, but I would say that I probably the second act where they go and they explore, uh, Rome and stuff like that. I think it, it does kind of bog the film down a little bit. So I, I would like like just a couple cuts there, and I think that would be good enough. Uh, so like an hour and 45 minutes would probably be fine for this movie because I think it l- runs just a tad bit long. But other than that, it's a pretty engaging movie. It's got a great score. Um, you know, it's a nice uh, down-to-earth approach to religion where it doesn't really have a – it doesn't really come down on a side. So it doesn't really say like, oh, yeah, you got to stick to Catholic Christianity – uh, or you you even have to believe in something like that, you know, it it do, it doesn't really matter in the in the scheme of things. So I I like that a lot because that's one of the downfalls of some of the exorcism movies. Um, and then other than that, you know, Gregory Peck is actually really great in this movie, um, and it has a lot of eerie sort of lead up to it. So I think it works really well, and it does a good job for what it is. Um, it probably doesn't need sequels, but you know, that's neither here nor there. It's just something that ended up happening after this movie. 
Um, so I think it does a really good job. The Omen is very fun. Um, it's a great seventies movie, like classically seventies. I think it does it. It does what it wants to do very well. What about you? I give it an eight out of ten. Real quick tangent. Um, the priest, Father Brennan. Can't believe I just right realized this. That's Patrick Troughton, the second Doctor from Doctor Who. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize. Yeah, I knew he looked fucking familiar, and I was looking. I was like, "Where have I seen this goofy bastard before?" <laughs> Even though I'm not a Doctor Who fan, I I do know. But yeah. Anyhow, that being besides the point, I probably mispronounced his name, so I'm sorry. But eight out of ten, I like it a lot. I think it still holds up. It's a pretty fascinating little film. It's a nice combination of the ideas of The Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby. It's taking to a nice nice limit that kind of still to this day works. Now, it does work still. The violence in the film is very great. Still holds up. I think the acting in the film is terrific. I think Gregory Peck does a great job. Very memorable. Still misogynistic at times. Very likable g- guy. I think uh, Lee Remick as his wife is, you know, she's very endearing. Does a great job. I think uh, Billy Whitelaw as Mrs. Baylock. She's a great, you know, like uh, nihilistic, dark, you know, void. And I think... Uh, David Warner's Keith Jennings, the photographer, you know, does a great job. I think it's a nice little plot. It's not trying to say anything deep. It's not trying to be, you know, over the top and a thought provoker of a film when it comes to like its religious aspects. They're totally definitely taking like these ideas of like, you know, Christian, Christian apocalypse and kind of applying it to a horror film. And it works out very well. The kills are smart. They're well done. It's well paced. It's engaging. Richard Diner does a great job directing this film. It's very. It's. It, I can see why this is a film that's stuck into the cultural zeitgeist for a long time. I think it should still probably be there because I think it's just as good. It's, it's just as well made of a film as is The Exorcist. Maybe not as good as The Exorcist, but it's just a damn good made film. And an enjoyable, fun horror romp. So I'd say eight out of ten as well. Cool. Yeah, and we have, we haven't done The Exorcist yet. Why would we? <laughs> it's we're tough. To, yeah, we're, no. gonna do, we're gonna do the sequels before we ever hit the Exorcist. <clears throat> it's tough to tough to find something to say about some like something that's already been spoken about so much. But um, yeah, what do you th- what do you think about for next time? I don't know what's coming up. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, you know, like we're we're entering that part of the time where we really don't have anything specific to do. Um, but I'm sure we'll, lighthouse. I'm sure we'll find <laughs> just do a lighthouse. Uh, I'm sure we'll find something to do here. We'll, we'll pick something. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a fun time though. Trying. To Are we going to be? Do, do, I say so because May is when we did difficult films. Are we going to venture back into that? Yeah, or? we try to do difficult films again. We pick some pick some different ones. Uh, I think Cannibal Holocaust will definitely be on the agenda for this time. Ooh, we still haven't done that. That's right. You know, we haven't done the witch. It's true. We haven't done the witch. Yep. We could do that one next if you want to. Robert Eggers film. Because I feel like around the same time as when we did Lighthouse. So sure. Might, yeah, and, and yeah. we're kind of leading up to, I think, the his uh, adaptation or whatever you want to call no. it of Nosferatu is completed. So he's uh, working on that. It's supposed to come out Christmas. Yeah. Nosferatu would be a fun movie to do, too. Like the actual, you know, original Nosferatu. That, that'd be a, an interesting one to talk about. We could do that. I think it's a nice, nice eerie one. We don't have to do it next time, but. Uh, I would be fine with The Witch. Um, I have seen it one time. I saw it in theaters. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a fun movie. It's a, well, I shouldn't say fun. It's not, it's not a fun <laughs> movie. But it is a good movie. So. You know what? I thought of uh, a good four films to do for Difficult Films Month. Yeah. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> it's just like uh, <laughs> difficult sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't uh, know. We'll have to think about 
the actual agenda. I, I think Cannibal Holocaust should go on there. If you want to, we could do a Serbian film. So, I have it. We could do it. Why um, not? The other thing, too, is like, you know, when you talk about difficult films, I think there is like a, a fine line between difficult films where it's like, yeah, they're like, you know, the, the subject matter is difficult versus the actual content is difficult where it's like, oh, you know, there's actual, you know, animal murders, which Cannibal Holocaust has, uh, you know, and there's like, you know, it's like, you know, the cat three sort of like Japanese <laughs> movies, you know, stuff like that. It's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, we could talk about what kind of a agenda we want for difficult films. I think that would be. Cannibal Holocaust, I, th- I definitely think we should do. And I definitely, I think if you do Cannibal Holocaust, you do have to watch. There is the BBC, the BBFC cut, uh, which, uh, you know, basically eliminates all of the animal cruelty. But I do think for the first time t- to really experience it, you do need to see it as intended whole um, just for the experience and I would say, you know, I've seen I've seen the uh, the full uncut version, and um, I probably wouldn't choose besides difficult films. I wouldn't choose to watch the uncut version again because I do think the BBFC removal of animal cruelty is probably just fine to watch. Uh, but I do think that you do need to see you ju- you just need to experience it as as what, it is. What about Caligula? <clears throat> yeah, Cal- I mean. I don't know. Would you consider Caligula like really a difficult film though? Like, is it a, like, uh, it's, it, I've, I've never seen it before. But yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know if I would Great. say it's difficult. It's, you know, it's seeing Malcolm McDowell naked. Is that <laughs> yeah. difficult? Or, or right. Yeah. No, yeah. No, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would consider it difficult, but yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> yeah. We can, we can talk about the agenda for that, for that, uh, that one. So, yeah, it'd be fun though. I, I, the difficult films always fun. One we could do funny games the remake, which is basically Michael Haneke just doing the same thing again, but with We're Naomi. W- yeah, Naomi Watts. So, oh, Urban Legend two. As that would be a difficult film, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or like any of the uh, the. I know. Uh, I still know what you did. Last yeah, exactly. Song. Like <laughs> any of those sort of like sequels from the from that time period. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, if you want to listen to us uh, cover difficult films or you know any other movies that we cover on the podcast, you should subscribe to us on any podcast app that you can you can think of or you use. We're on uh, Apple Podcasts, our home base at Spotify with Joe Rogan, or I th- actually I don't think he signed a contract with him this time, but anything really that you get your podcast on, we're on. So subscribe and leave us a nice review. We're on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for us on there, Blood and Black Rum Podcast. And we have an email address at bloodandblackrumpodcast at gmail.com. Write to us. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, what movies you want us to cover, and we'll definitely take that into consideration. And you can also donate to us on our Spotify or Patreon page where anything that you donate goes back towards beer. So we appreciate that in advance. Thanks for listening to our episode on The Omen. We hope you enjoyed it. Hope you have an infernal time uh, with whatever you're doing. And until next time, We'll think of something to review and hopefully good and take care. Yeah.